good evening. I'm a bit late to the party on this one, uh, but I just watched the highlights of the Japanese Grand Prix, and despite everyone already having talked about it, probably, um, and, you know, the, the excitement's possibly having died down a bit, I just wanted to talk about it, so... <laughs> because it was a race that I absolutely loved. Um, and that is a point I want to make, actually, is that I, it was the highlights that I watched on Channel 4. Um, because I don't have Sky, so all my thoughts are based off of the Channel 4 broadcast. So, apologies if I missed anything, or if some of the points I'm making don't possibly add up, in your opinion, um, to the live race. Um, you know, you can disagree, that's fine, but... <laughs> um, yeah, a possible reason for that might just be because... I'm watching the Channel 4 highlights. Um, but yeah, I, I was desperate to talk about it because it was just a race that I absolutely loved. Definitely my favourite of the season. I've not felt overly passionate about any of the ones we've had so far, I think. I think maybe a 6 out of 10 has been the highest we've had, in my opinion. Maybe a 7. Um, but this race was a, a solid 8, in my opinion. I just, I really, really loved it. It was obviously lacking a battle for the lead. But despite that, I, it was absolutely fantastic. And the Red Bulls weren't even as clear as we thought they might be because, you know, th this is always one of their strongest tracks. And we thought, similar to last season, after Max having a DNF and Japan being the next um, location to race, we thought he'd just dominate and the Revenge Tour would be in full swing. <laughs> um... But I think the fact that this is one of their strongest tracks, Max is st still in the form of his life, and they didn't have a pit stop gap, and, y you know, they had to overtake cars. <laughs> I think it, it just, it really bodes well for the, rest of the, for the rest of the season, and we've already seen how close Ferrari and McLaren can be. So I think the fact that they were not in the mix, you know, that they weren't battling for the lead, but the fact that they were just in the same picture as Red Bull, is really positive, and it's something I can get excited by, you know, maybe my standards are too low these days. <laughs> but can you blame me after what's happened before, you know? I, I think that's understandable, considering the context. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the start of the race was obviously very eventful. We had that red flag. Um, that was one positive from watching the Channel 4 highlights, is that the crash happened. Then it skips straight to the restart, saying we've had a half-hour delay. I thought, oh, great, I can miss that then, that's perfect. <laughs> um, but I think this was one of the rare cases, actually, where I just completely agreed with the stewards and everything that they said in the press report. Um, I think the fact that it was lap one and the presence of Stroll um, just possibly being a distraction and kind of maybe taking away some of Daniel's attention from Albon... Uh, I think it was just all really, it felt like they were using common sense for the first time in ages. It feels like they rarely use common sense, they always go by the book. And it can result in some very weird decisions where you think, were you looking at the screen? You know, were, were you just looking at the rule book or were you actually seeing what happened out there? Because this just doesn't add up, but yeah, th this was a really positive decision, I think, just to have it as a racing incident, um, but to make clear that if it wasn't lap one, and if it wasn't for all these other um, influences, uh, then it, it was probably going to be a different result. I think that was really, really refreshing from the stewards, so well done to them. You know, c credit where it's due, they made some weird decisions, but I completely agreed with everything they said about this one. Um, if you disagree, please let me know, because I'd love to hear what you think. Um, then we have the restart, where Perez, I think, gave us all a slight bit of hope, because Max's starts aren't bulletproof. He, you know, he's consistently good, but he's rarely amazing in starts. Um, I think a lot of his kind of defending for the lead of the starts comes from actually having to defend in the third one. He's, he never gets an amazing start and it's, and it's just already clear. So Perez in this instance had a better reaction and a better start and was almost side by side, but Max just knew what, what was coming. He had a plan in his head and just cut him off immediately. 
Um, but we've we've seen some amazing moves. You know, Alonso was th threatening on both starts to go around the outside of the first two corners um, on the soft tyres, which was uh, a good call from Aston Martin, I think. Even though it didn't work out, I think, you know, they had to try it. Um, and great effort from Nando to to get that close, to be honest, um, after the start he had. Um, but yeah, we had some amazing overtake from Sonoda especially, but also Stroll in the S section as well. Um, and I think, I might be wrong, but I believe it was Piastri into the hairpin. Um, and signs into Spoon on the two Mercedes cars. They were just absolutely fantastic overtakes. You know, it wasn't all DRS. There's only one DRS zone, and I think we saw fewer overtakes on the main straights that we did throughout the rest of the track over the course of the race. It was incredible. Um, I think often when you when we come to these circuits where you think, okay, it's tough to overtake, a lot of the drivers don't even try. But it felt like they just had a different mindset this weekend of, okay, it's difficult to overtake here, but not impossible. I'm going to try something new. I'm going to, you know, I, I don't know. It just felt like they had a different mindset and they were prepared to risk more this race. I, d I don't know why. Um, yeah, I, I think it was Stroll especially into that left-hander after the S's before going to, into the two Degners. Um, it was just so risky on that uh, steak Sauber car or whatever they're called. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the move was not done. He had to really commit and put a lot of faith in the other driver to not cause a crash. And it was just fantastic, and he pulled it off. Um, in fact, staying on the topic of Stroll briefly, usually he has the most anonymous races. Like, he can start 18th and just finish 9th or something, and you think, how the hell did Stroll end up in the points? We've not seen him all race, but he just manages to get points all the time. And I feel like this is the most TV action he's had in multiple seasons. <laughs> and he, I, I'm pretty sure he didn't get points. He finished, what, 11th or 12th or something, I think. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm certain he, he didn't get points, even after all these overtakes. And I thought, he's driven absolutely brilliantly. Um, so yeah, uh, sh shame for Lance, because I think he deserved a lot more. But, you, you know, all, all, basically all the points positions now are just taken up by the top teams, so... That that said, Aston Martin are one of those teams that should be in the points, you know, so a, a shame, but he was really let down by his qualifying performance, so, you know, at the, at the end of the day, it was his fault that he was starting so far back, but he, he did make up for it in the race, and it was a shame he didn't get anything to show for it. Um, but yeah, some amazing overtakes, and it just felt like there were battles constantly throughout the field. I think there was maybe one slightly dull stage, maybe a third into the race or so. But then, you know, the, the second half was completely insane. The first quarter or so was amazing. Um, and it was just one of the few races this season that I've just not wanted to look away at any point. Um, yeah, Miss, also Mercedes. Oh my God, I'm a Hamilton fan, um, if you didn't know already. So this was a painful one. <laughs> but it was so hard to like feel bad for him because drivers were putting such amazing moves on him <laughs> that I was just enjoying every battle. <laughs> and I was like, oh my god, this is such great entertainment and I'm loving this battle, but why does it have to be on Lewis? <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, it was kind of mixed emotions, this race, because... Every time we cut to a really close battle, it was often Lewis ahead, about to be overtaken. So I was on the fence of what to feel. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm remaining positive and it resulted in, in an amazing race. And I'm not going to say it was a terrible race just because my favourite driver had a bad result. I'm not, I'm not one of those fans. <laughs> um, yeah, Mercedes need to pull their act together. I think this shows how long it's been since they were fighting at the front because even if they had a dominant car this race their operational strategies and decisions shows that they are not the team that they once were and i think them accepting accepting that 
is a major obstacle to overcome in getting back to the front because I think uh, uh, Williams is also a victim of this. They rely so much on their history and where they once were that they just they still believe that they're the same team that they were in. They're kind of in the same position that they were in. They're just operating the same. But when you're that far back and when it's such a different context to what they were once in, you can't op operate the same ways. It won't work. And this really shows that I think they've... That they're just at a loss at how to behave in these situations, you know, without a, a dominant car. And it's really sad to see. And I'm not frightened one bit for Lewis going to Ferrari because at the moment it's a much better place to be. You know, and... On that note, credit to Ferrari. They absolutely smashed this race and deserved a 3-4, 100%, because, you know, the drivers were on top of things, but they weren't... They weren't in such a panicky situation this race where they had to make all their decisions themselves and had to command the team what, what strategy they wanted to be on, because the team knew what the plan was, they stuck to it, they could, they adapted. You know, I feel like with uh, Leclerc's race especially, they weren't always in the position they wanted to be, but they adapted to it perfectly and made the best out of it. Um, because the, it, they just felt much more in control. And, you know, it wasn't... Like they still kind of had that laid-back attitude and, like, they were trying to protect their reputation of Ferrari and not you know, having that tone of, you know, but plan B, plan A having failed, so, you know, the only other options are failure, it wasn't like that, it, they were just really efficient, and they deserved everything they've got, and credit to Carlos again, he was the better driver throughout this weekend, it was really unlucky, I think, for Leclerc to be that far back in qualifying with just a tenth separating them, but in the race, Carlos was perfection. Obviously, Charles made that small mistake in Degna 2. Um, but his his pace was there. He executed the strategy perfectly. And he still had a good race, in my opinion. I don't think he can be ridiculed that much for the mistake. But, you know, I, th I think he was punished for it in that Carlos finished ahead of him. Because Carlos was faultless and he got the podium. So, you know, I, I think that's the right result. Um, and yeah, obviously, we have to praise Red Bull. I'm sick of it. I think we all are at this point, but how can you not? They are on another level. Um, and it's great to see Checo as well performing at these races. I was really scared for him after Melbourne that... It was just going to be a repeat of last year with him having a good couple of races and then falling off for the rest for the rest of the season. But the way he bounced back this race really gave me confidence that he's a new driver and that he's not just going to go into a you know a rut of bad form after one bad race. I think he's really pulled back well, um, and you know it's annoying that the first two positions are now taken up pretty much. Uh, you know as opposed to just the one being taken up and, you know, them being a fight for second, it's now gone to a fight for third, which is frustrating. <laughs> just, just, Perez is such a, a lovely guy that I, I just, I'm really glad that he's getting these second places now, Be, for, you know, for him as a person and for his mental situation as well. It's just wonderful to see. So credit to him. Well done to Max once again. Congrats to Red Bull on the 1-2 at um, the home race of Honda, who can't decide where they want to be in Formula 1 at the moment. But, you know, it, I feel like all the credit they're getting for powering the Red Bull, essentially, just, just put your sticker on their car, you know? <laughs> it's such a weird situation, but I think feel like from next year it's going to be a lot clearer. Um <laughs> So, yeah, those are my thoughts. I'd love to know your thoughts on the Japanese Grand Prix, and I hope you're looking, for, looking forward to the next one. I know I definitely am after that race. I loved it. Um, other than that, thank you for listening, and I'll speak to you very soon.
Goodbye.